in the book of Colossians for the next few weeks, ex for one exception. Next week we are going to pause. I know we're just starting in Colossians, but next week we're going to pause and go and focus on baptism for one Sunday. The state of North Carolina, the North Carolina Baptists have asked for all churches to put an emphasis on baptism. And so we'll look at that next week. But other than that, for the next 11 weeks, we're going to be in the book of Colossians. And we're going to go through and, and hear of what God has to say. And I'm excited. I, I am. I, I've just. I've, I'll tell you, I cannot wait to dive into the book of Colossians with you. Uh, I was up late last night just thinking about it, and this morning thinking about it. And I, it, God has placed this on my heart a while ago, and I, I'm excited. I, I'm excited about what He has to say for us. Because here's the deal. Here, if I could sum up Colossians in one simple statement, here it is. Jesus above all. That Jesus is above all. And so when we look at Colossians, you will hear in the next 11 weeks, Jesus above all. It's not about, is Jesus above this? Is Jesus above this situation? Uh, or, or what's important here? The answer is always Jesus above all. So I will tell you yesterday in my house when I'm having a, an issue. And if you don't know, I cheered in college. And so I still have a little bit of cheerleader in heart. And so here was my dilemma yesterday morning. I turned to Cassidy and said, well, I don't know what I'm going to wear to preach tomorrow. And she said, what? Seriously, we're talking about this? I said, well, I have a big concern. I was going to wear purple because I assume TCU will win tonight and I want to represent Texas Christian. It, it's the start of college football season. It's really important. I said, on the other hand, I, as an alum of UNC Charlotte, them beating Duke, I really should be wearing UNC Charlotte colors. Can't wear Carolina colors. We'll not talk about that right now. And so I'm having this dilemma and then... I, I'll go ahead and answer the question. The reason I chose yellow and blue is because this shirt didn't need to be ironed. That was the answer. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, I spent way too much time on something that no one is going to notice except for me. Now, I do realize I can't wear my UNC 49ers color tie next week because Van's going to think it's for the Green Bay Packers, and I don't need that kind of pressure. But the truth of the matter is, it's trivial things, and we can laugh about that. But how many times do we put the importance of something trivial ahead of Jesus? How many times do we place the emphasis on what are we wearing, what are we doing, more so than who are we serving? And so Colossians is this answer to the fact that Paul is writing, and he says to them, Jesus above all. If we can be a church that always says we're Jesus above all, then the trivial things that we wrestle with, the arguments that naturally come, the conflicts that we naturally struggle with, or the desires of our own heart start to fade because the answer is always Jesus above all. So look with me at Colossians 1 and 2. Here's what it says in verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy our brother, to the saints in Christ at Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father. So, if you were here for um, revival, you heard a great sermon on this passage from Paul Salibi, and I will tell you, I'm not even touching where he's going, but but it was a great entry. But here's a reminder that I want to tell you. These two verses say a lot. The first is this, that Paul is the author. Now what we need to know about Paul is he is writing this from prison. The, the church in Colossae, the, the Colossian church, Paul has never visited. As a matter of fact, it's thought that in the tradition of in church history, it's thought that while he was in Ephesus for two years, he discipled a man named Epaphras, who then moved to Col Colossae, started the church. And so this is really a disciple of Paul discipling people. 
And, and we see this importance that Paul, from prison, when it could be all about, look at me, look what I've given for the gospel, and look, make sure you focus on me, Paul writes a letter that says, hey, I want you to remember, no matter what's going on, good or bad, Jesus above all. And we see even that, that Timothy's writing with him. The reason that that's the case is, picture this, Paul is in a jail cell, Timothy is outside the jail cell, and as Paul is talking and dictating, Timothy's writing. And then we see in verse 2, it says, To the saints at the, Christ at Colossae, or the church at Colossae. I want you to remember something. These people, Paul defines as saints. So when he corrects them, when he guides them, they're good people that love Jesus. The problem that Paul's going to address is they have teachers amongst them that are teaching things that are maybe even good things or maybe even putting focal points on things. But it's do this and Jesus. See, at the time, there, was this, there were two different camps that were battling in the church of Colossae and, and, and in the New Testament time. The first is Gnosticism. Basically, it's this idea that, that it's Christ can't be the Son of God. Christ has to, because if He's born in flesh, then as you and I, our nature is, is corrupt, and so therefore He can't be God. And, and so either Christ was a heavenly being, an angel, that never takes on flesh, which destroys the, the cross, or it's a lie. The other was synchronization, which basically was this practice of saying this plus this equals salvation. For example, when we worship, it should be Jesus, but make sure we're worshiping the angels as well. It, it is the idea that we add to the gospel. I can point to you faiths that claim the name of Jesus, but they also say, you need to have Jesus, but you also need to have this many good works. You need to do this. And, and I'm here to tell you, if nothing else, hear this. Salvation is through Jesus alone and it's nothing to do with you. Because Jesus is above all. And, and when we see this church in Colossae, a lot of times, I don't know about you, but I get in this mindset of the Paul's writing to a, a big church at a big place. It's, it, it's a name brand church. But Colossae is not that. Colossae is a town in, in a valley near a river that at one time was large in tourism and large in, in business. But by the time that Paul is writing to the church in Colossae, it is a run down backwater town. I'm going to insult somebody, and I'm sorry if I do, but I'll tell you what I think about when I, when I was studying this. I think of the town of Monroe. Here's why. If you've ever driven through downtown Monroe, you see businesses that are, that are no longer there. But you can imagine, and some of you have experienced, that downtown Monroe was a busy place that, was, that people didn't go to town to Charlotte. They went to town to Monroe. That Monroe was, downtown was a thriving place at one time and then you drive down now and it's, well there's an empty building. There's a business that looks like it's barely hanging on if they're even open at all. And this is what Colossae is. So I want you to understand the significance of this church is not in their numbers or not in their name brand. I think sometimes we read scripture and we start comparing and we say in things like, hey, well, that would be great. And, and that really applies in a church that was bigger, a church that is well known, really could make an impact. And I'm here to tell you, Paul's not writing to that big church. This is not a Hickory Grove. This is not an elevation. This is a Clear Creek size church. And that's important for us to understand. It's important for us to know but Paul is addressing this issue. He's addressing this idea that Christ needs to be above all in their life. I, I heard it said this way. There's a, a pastor in Colorado. His name is J.T. English. And, and this is something he said on the matter. He said, the greatest danger in our lives is not apostasy. 
It's not the abandonment or renunciation of religious or, or, or political belief, but it is apathy. See, the greatest danger for you and I as Christians is not that we denounce our faith, it's that we don't care about our faith. It's that we say we love Christ, but we also love this. And I will love Christ as much as anyone unless the preacher goes over at 1 o'clock and then there's kickoff. Or until my stomach says it's time to get out of here. Or figure out another one. Because the truth of the matter is that's what Paul's addressing, that it is apathy, not denial of faith. It's, yeah, I'm a believer. Let's keep going. And so what I want to do today is we're actually going to walk through four chapters of Colossians and I'm going to give you overviewing themes of the book and then we're going to, in a couple of weeks, start breaking that down and getting smaller in our portions. And so let's look at the first one. The first one's really simple and we've already hit on it. Jesus is the center of everything. Jesus is the center of everything. Colossians 15, 1, 15 says this, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by Him, in Him, and on earth. The visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things and by all things hold together. He, he is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on his cross. Paul is basically saying that all things revolve around Christ. I want to read you a, a quote that I discovered, and it's, by a church father, Athanasius. Here's what he says. Christ, the all-powerful, all-holy word of the Father, spreads his power over all things everywhere, enlightening things seen and unseen, holding and bonding all together in himself. Nothing is left empty of his presence, but to all things and through all, so severally and collectively, he is the giver of sustainer of life. He, he puts it another way too, and he gives this beautiful image that I heard once, and, and it's this. The God who comes and dwells through the virgin birth as he is nursing at his mother's side is holding the stars in place. See, the Jesus we serve dwells but sustains. Even when he is in his flesh, Scripture says he holds the universe in place. He's telling the planets where to circle, how far to circle. He's telling stars where to be and when to shine. That is the God we serve. And so Paul is addressing and saying, Jesus is the center of everything. So my question to you is, is Jesus the center of your everything? Because I will tell you, it's really easy for us in our culture to seek happiness in everything but Jesus. I, I will know people that wake up today because of what a 21-year-old did with a leather blown-up ball that their life will either be happier today or worse today because of how many points some 20-year-old kids scored. I, I know that's going to happen. And I love, I've already told you, I love sports as much as anyone. I dress accordingly. But why do we let things like that dictate whether we have a good day or a bad day? Why do we put things outside of the center of the universe as our joy and happiness? Why does our life get fixated on this person? If they don't make me happy, then I'm just not going to be happy. If they don't bring me fulfillment, then I'm going to be disappointed. If this doesn't bring me fulfillment, then I'm going to be disappointed. 
But the truth of the matter is this. Peter Scazzaro says, happiness is the one thing in life everybody is after. We look to honors, glory, power, pleasures, riches, bodily health. But the very de definition of happiness is the person of Jesus, and he is in heaven. If our life doesn't revolve around Jesus, it always revolves around disappointment. So make Jesus the center of everything. Here's the second thing we see in the book of Colossians. Second theme is this. Who Jesus is to you has implications for every part of your life. Who Jesus is has implications for every part of our lives. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says it this way. So then, just as you would receive Christ as Jesus, Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, being rooted and built up in heaven and established in the faith, just as you were taught, overflowing with gratitude. <clears throat> this week I'm, I'm taking a theology class at seminary and this is one of the things I came across was an A.W. Tozer quote. It says, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Because what you think about God determines how you live your life. If God is just... It, a Santa Claus version of God where he's just supposed to bless you and give you everything you pray for, then you're going to, every one of your prayers is going to be, God, I need this. God, I need this. And when you don't get it, you become bitter. If God is all love with no justice, all you see is, God, why does bad things happen? Don't you love everything? Well, I can get away with this because God loves. Or, if you think God is all justice and no love, then what happens is you start looking at people and going, get your life right. And then shame enters into your life because you realize your life can't be right. We have to have a healthy focus on who Christ is. We have to understand that who Jesus is has real implications for our lives. Who we view God to be when we think of God dictates a lot of things. If you're someone like me, I, I'll be honest. When things don't go according to my plan, it's a bad day in my house. I am a note-taking, planning type of person. And if my plans don't work out just so, if I have to go to a backup plan, it's not a good day. I don't even care if the plan turns out okay. I'm still mad because it's not the way that I'd originally planned it. I'm going to say this, and there probably might be an amen on this side, but sometimes I'm a bit of a control freak. Don't, no, no. But the truth of the matter is, like, I want things to go my way. I, I will tell you, I have a little bit of OCD. If you walk into my office right now, open up my right-hand drawer, top drawer, I have different brands of pens in different little trays because the pens should not mix. <laughs> Thanks. Really appreciate that, Liz. I have a system, and when my system is messed up, I lose control. But here's the problem. If I look at God as the one that is in control and that He is sovereign and in control of everything, then I realize I'm not in control of anything. But it is only when I have the healthy view of God that I can remember that my plans don't really matter because they're not eternal like God's. See, it is for us that we look. How we look at Christ will have implications to our life. Here's the third thing. False teaching is real and it will destroy you. Look at... Chapter 2, verse 8, it says this, Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy or empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. And then in 18, Let no one condemn you by belighting in aesthetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. He doesn't hold on to the head from whom the whole body nourishes and held together by its ligaments and tendons grows with growth from God. If we are going to be deceived 
and it's coming and it's easy, then our life gets off the trajectory of where Christ has called us. I, I will tell you, I, I have seen false teaching and I, I will tell you the false teachers sometimes can grow groups quickly. I mean, you, you know the stories. I, I can put you to Waco and, and talk about people like David Koresh that because he was captivating and because he took people's earnest belief that they want to meet Jesus and twisted it enough for them to die because they missed the mark of Jesus. And those are extreme stories, but I don't have to go that extreme. I can point to you faiths that, that missed the mark. I can point to you people that, that sit in churches, sit under pastors that, that teach the Word of God, but the problem is, somewhere in their mind, they've heard one thing that gets them skewed just a little bit. And if you know anything about charting, if, if you were to set sail and you were off course by one degree, it doesn't make a big deal if you're going 10 feet. But if you're going 10,000 miles, you completely miss your mark and then some. See, we need to be vested in the Word of God. We need to be vested in what the Bible says, and that's all that matters. Everything else is secondary. The Word of God is primary in our lives, and everything else falls behind. And when that's the case, then we can move forward. See, because what the church in Colossae was dealing with was people that are coming, hey, Jesus is great. Yeah, you're right. We should worship Jesus. But, but you know what else we should worship? I mean, the, the, they used angels to tell about the coming of Jesus, so shouldn't we honor them? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we praise the angels? I mean, they're godly figures. They're holy. And this church is going, well, that, that's, yeah, maybe so. We don't want to dishonor God, and if, if angels are holier than us, we should lift them up in reverence. And, and what Paul is saying is, no, Christ above all. That Christ is the only thing because anything else will lead us astray. And as it says in verse 19, that if we're disconnected from the head, where is growth? Here's the, here's the challenge for that point, though. Problem is, none of us think we're deceived. Everyone, if there's two people that disagree and you're in the argument, you think they're deceived and I think you're deceived. That's how this works. It doesn't matter where it comes from. We all assume that the other person is deceived. And so my challenge to you is, what's this say? Because if this says something, this is pure in the Word of God. Our opinions don't really match up. Then we're wrong. And so for us... Are we looking to the God of the Bible? Are we looking to the Word of God? Or are we just trusting people? Let me tell you, one of the reasons why I was so, I, I was so excited that the deacon said, yeah, go ahead and order pew Bibles is this. I know we put it up on the screen, but I will encourage you, read through Scripture. I, I'll tell you what I'm preaching. Read through it. And if I say something that the, the Word of God is not saying, call me out on it. I 100% believe that we should be looking here. And if you're looking to me and not looking here, then we're dropping the ball. And if I tell you to look at me rather than Scripture, then get rid of me as fast as you can. Here's the fourth thing. The church of God, the church is God's family. Look at Colossians 3, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against you, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. See, you and I are called to be the body of Christ, that we are to be in unity with one another. You and I are to be patient with one another. 
aware of each other's burdens, to come alongside of one another. See, the Bible doesn't call for the church to be uniform. It, uniformity says that I will bear with you and I will work with you as long as you agree with what I say. But unity says I'm willing to hang with you in spite of our differences. There's a difference in false teaching, which we addressed before, and just differences. There, there's different perspectives. I will tell you, my upbringing, my growth, I grew up in Union County. My opinion on life looks a whole lot different than someone that grew up in New York City. It's the same way with, with Scripture. We read this. There is an accurate interpretation. But there are philosophies of Scripture that we might disagree on. That we might look and say, I, I see this a little bit different. I, to answer that question, we see that in denominations. There's some that say, hey, uh, the Bible says this, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that. So uh, I'm not going to baptize children. We're going to baptize believers. I, I'm not going to, we're going to do the Lord's Supper this way, and we're going to do the Lord's Supper this way. Those are differences that are okay. Because baptism points to Jesus. Now, we have a personal opinion. We'll talk about that next week about why we do what we do. But the truth of the matter is, different opinions don't mean that people are against each other. That's why I was so thankful that Paul came from Benton Heights Presbyterian to be at Revival. And I was so thankful for us as a church embracing that and enjoying him. Because the truth of the matter is, Presbyterians, Methodists, they're not our enemy. They're our brothers in Christ. And you and I are brothers and sisters in Christ, and so it doesn't matter some of our differences. It matters that the gospel of Jesus Christ is in us. It, it doesn't matter what we're wrestling with. It, it is a matter of who do we serve? Because I will tell you, I've served in Baptist churches that have fought over colors of carpet. And, and that sounds ridiculous. But... All of our trivial passions are just as important to us as carpet was to someone else. So the question is, is Jesus glorified in the carpet color? No, Jesus is glorified by His people living like His people. Right. That we love it, that we love one another. We put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I, I will tell you, I, I must confess, I live in a dark world sometimes of Twitter. Because Twitter and Facebook and everywhere else has this uh, ability to go on and just share what you want to say. And everyone thinks that their opinion matters. And so I, I laugh because no matter what you say, somebody on Twitter is going to be angry about it. You could, post, you could post on Twitter. I could go out today and be like, hey, it's a sunny, pretty day here in Charlotte. Somebody would be like, no, it's not. And the sun's out. It's not 900 degrees like it has been. It's a pretty day. No, it's too hot. It's too cold. It's not bright enough. It's too bright. We need to, and, and sadly, Twitter is an example of church. We look for reasons to dispute each other. But we need to live in unity. See, if you're at Thanksgiving dinner with your family and and turkey's overcooked. You getting up and saying, I'm never part of this family again? Some may. You shouldn't. That's the point. <laughs> or if your spouse looks at you wrong, you're going, I'm, I'm filing for divorce. If you're going to look at me like that, I'm done. Or uh, pick something. You're going to disown your kids because they did something? That, hey, I told you to clean your room, and you know those blocks go on that shelf, not this one. What defines us is the gospel and Jesus above all. Not our differences. And that's why we should walk in discipleship together. That's why we should walk with one another. That's why we should move forward. And then here's the last point. The Bible is central to the whole Christian life. Verse 